Hello again, Econ160. Welcome to the second half of our lecture on firms in perfectly competitive markets. If you're just tuning in and you haven't seen the first half, I recommend that you turn off this video and watch the first half of the lecture because what we're going to do here builds upon the stuff that we learned in the first video. In the first half of the lecture, we studied how individual firms make decisions in a perfectly competitive market. Today, we're going to study how the collective decisions of lots of individual firms translates to market level outcomes. And we're also going to study what happens to the market in the long run as firms start to enter or exit the market. First, let's take a look at how a firm's individual decision making gives rise to its individual short run supply curve. On the left, I'm showing a firm's cost curves and on the right, I want us to plot the firm's individual supply curve. Let's start with a price of 13. If the market price is 13, what quantity does this firm choose to produce? That's right, it will choose to produce 13. So we can mark that on the right-hand side graph here. And so at a price of $13, the firm will choose to produce 13 quantity. Okay, now let's go down to the price of 12. What quantity does the firm choose to produce? That's right, 12. So let's mark that point on the firm's supply curve. Now we can repeat this process for each price level. $11, $10, $9, $8. Okay, quick quiz. At a price of $8, what's happening to the firm? That's right, the firm is making short run losses, right? Because the price is below the average total cost curve. But it's still choosing to continue to produce in the short run because the price is still above the average variable cost. All right, so let's keep going. $7, $6, $5, $4. All right, and so now we're at $3. What happens at $3? That's right, now the price is below the average variable cost curve, and so the firm no longer produces even in the short run. The quantity supplied by this firm goes down to zero. So the point on the individual supply curve is actually over here, $3 but zero quantity. And it's gonna be the same if the price is $2, quantity supplied will still be zero, and the same with $1, and the same with zero dollars. So this shows you that a firm's individual supply curve is indeed the same as its marginal cost curve as long as marginal cost is above the average variable cost. But there is a price below which the quantity supply just turns to zero. Now let's see how the behavior of many individual firms adds up to market level outcomes. Suppose we have 100 identical firms, identical to the one that we just did on the previous slide. So every one of their individual supply curves looks like this one here on the left. How does that translate into a market supply curve? To get the market supply curve, we simply add up each of the individual firm supply curves. So for any price below $4, each individual firm is producing zero, and so the quantity supplied in the market will also be zero for each of the prices, $0, $1, $2, and $3. Uh, for all of these prices, the quantity supplied in the market will be zero. Okay, but what happens at $4? At $4, each individual firm is supplying four units. And since there are 100 identical firms, what's the total quantity supplied in the market? That's right, it's 400. So let's mark that with this point over here. And on the x-axis, what is the total market quantity? It's 400. Okay, how about when price is $5? At $5, each individual firm is supplying five units. So the total quantity supplied in the market would be 500. So we would mark that point over here and the total quantity in the market would be 500. All right, so I think you get the picture and we can basically calculate total quantity supplied in the market 
at any price level. and so on, right? Um, And so all we need to know is each individual firm's supply curve, and we can add that up to get our market supply curve. Okay, now let's think about interactions between the market and the firm. Specifically, if something happens that affects supply or demand in the market, What does that do to a firm's profits? Here's an example from the market for surgical masks. Supply and demand in the market for surgical masks is shown up here on the top right. And on the bottom right, we have the cost curves for one of the suppliers of surgical masks, the company 3M. Now, let's assume that coronavirus causes a surge in demand for masks which pushes the demand up from D1 to D2. What does this do to the quantity of surgical masks that 3M chooses to produce? And what does it do to 3M's profits? First, let's mark the before price and the after price on 3M's cost curves. Price before the coronavirus was $5. Price after the coronavirus was $7. And 3M is going to choose to produce where price equals marginal cost. So when the price was 5, 3M chose to produce 5 units. And since average total cost was also 5, the profit before coronavirus was 0. When price was 7, 3M chose to produce 7 units. And at 7 units, average total cost is 5.5. And thus the profit is given by this rectangle here, which is equal to a length of 7 times a height of 1.5. And so the profit after coronavirus is 7 times 1.5, which is equal to 10.5. So quantity increased by 2 and profits increased by 10.5. All right, so this example shows that a positive demand shock is going to increase the quantity produced as well as increase firms' short-run profits. Okay, so a positive demand shock for surgical masks driven by coronavirus pushed up prices causing firms to produce more masks and earn greater profits. But sensing the greater profits, this actually induces more firms to enter the market for surgical masks. And so supply goes from S1 to S2, while demand stays elevated at D2. So now we ask, given this combined demand and supply curve shift, How does 3M's quantity and profit change relative to before coronavirus? That is, how do things compare at D1 and S1 to how things are at D2 and S2? Well, the first thing to note is that actually the before price and the after price are both the same at $5 which means that on the cost curve, we only have one line at $5. Thus, the quantity produced by 3M is here at P equals MC, and that's at quantity 5, both before and after the coronavirus. And since price also equals average total cost here, profits are zero both before and after. So this example shows that An initial demand shock might raise profits temporarily, but once other firms start to enter the market, then that's going to shift the market supply curve outwards, even without any change in production technology, and this could push prices back down. And it's possible for the prices to be pushed back all the way to the point where you just started, uh, which is what happens in this example. From the examples we've done so far, we saw how firms can make either positive or negative profits in the short run, depending on the current market price. But we also saw how temporary profits may be short-lived, 
because if something happens to increase profits in a market, then pretty soon other firms are going to want to enter that market. As more and more firms enter the market, the supply curve expands outwards, thus bringing price back down and bringing profits back down as well. Uh, on the other hand, if firms are making short run losses, then they're going to want to exit. And as these firms exit, the number of firms is going to shrink and the supply curve is going to shift inwards, which would push prices back up and it'll help profits to recover for the firms that remain in the market. So this explains how long run dynamics work in perfectly competitive markets. If there are short run profits, then over the long run, firms are going to enter and compete those profits away. On the other hand, if there are short run losses, then over the long run, some firms are going to exit and for the firms that remain, profits are going to recover. All right, so we say that a market is in a long run equilibrium if one, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Uh, so that's what we've always had before. But another condition is two, that there aren't any more firms that want to enter or any firms that want to exit. Okay, so in some ways, uh, we mean that the number of firms in the market has stabilized. Uh, but since firms want to enter if profits are positive and they want to exit if profits are negative, then in the long run, we can expect firms to be making zero profits. All right. Uh, so does it make sense for firms to all be making zero profits in the long run? I mean, if firms didn't make profits, then why would anyone want to start a business? So the answer is that it actually does make sense if we're referring to economic profits, right? Uh, so we're not saying that accounting profits are going to be zero in the long run equilibrium. So firms are making money. Um, but what we're saying is that the accounting profits are going to be just enough to cover their opportunity costs, okay? so that the true economic profit is zero. All right, and so this has important implications for uh, what we can forecast profits to be. If we can get some measure of opportunity cost uh, in an industry, then if the industry is competitive, we should expect the accounting profits uh, for each of the firms in the industry to be equal to or similar to the opportunity cost. Now I'm going to play an animation that illustrates how a market might transition from one long run equilibrium to another. So we start with a market that's in long run equilibrium. The supply curve and the demand curve intersect at the price where firms are making zero profits. That is where P, MC, and ATC all intersect. Now let's say there's a demand shock that pushes up demand. So demand goes up and the equilibrium price goes up along with it. Now the firm is making positive short run profits because P equals MC is above the average total cost curve. But since firms are making positive profits, that's going to cause other firms to enter the market. Gradually, the supply curve starts to shift outwards as the number of firms increases. And firms are going to keep entering until prices are pushed back down to the point where profits are exactly zero again. That is to the point where P, MC, and ATC all intersect once more. So prices are back to where they were before and firms are all making zero profits again, but things aren't entirely the same. So look here, in the new long run equilibrium, we actually have more firms and more quantity being sold in the market, despite prices being the same as before. So the lesson here is that when there's a positive demand shock in a perfectly competitive market, the firms are going to first enjoy some short run profits, uh, but those profits won't last very long. And in the long run, those profits are going to disappear. However, the market is going to expand with a greater number of firms and a greater total quantity being transacted between buyers and sellers.
All right, to recap, a market is in long run equilibrium when supply equals demand and when all firms are making zero economic profits so that no firm wants to enter and no firm wants to leave. The market supply and demand diagram combined with the firm's cost curves will look like what we have here on the slides. One important point to note is that the long run equilibrium price is going to be the price at which firms are producing at efficient scale, which if you'll remember means the quantity at which average total cost is being minimized. This is a good thing. It means that if we let perfectly competitive markets gravitate towards their long run equilibrium, then over time the firms are going to become maximally efficient and society will be able to produce goods at the lowest possible cost per unit. Okay, so I know that was a lot to absorb. Let me close off the lecture by giving you some reasons for why all this stuff matters. How does understanding firm and market dynamics help us as citizens or help us as uh, businessmen or in whatever field that we're going to work in in the future? Well, first, uh, if we understand that economic profits are zero in long run equilibrium, then we know that accounting profit should equal opportunity cost. In the corporate world where money is what counts the most, the most important opportunity cost is known as the opportunity cost of capital. That is the profit that investors could have made by investing in some other business or industry. So if the accounting profit exceeds the opportunity cost of capital for a particular business, and if the market is truly competitive, then those profits probably won't last long because new firms will enter and compete those profits away. Another way of saying this is that as an industry matures, profits become harder to come by. But there's also another important implication, which is that if we consistently observe a business with accounting profits that exceed its opportunity cost of capital, and it doesn't appear that other firms are coming in to compete those profits away, then that firm likely does not operate in a competitive market. So regulators benchmark the degree to which a market is competitive by how much its profits exceed the opportunity cost of capital. If profits are too high relative to the cost of capital, then regulators will suspect that the market might have some anti-competitive behavior going on. And finally, we should care about long-run dynamics in competitive markets because it gives a pretty powerful argument in support of free markets. Not only do competitive markets equate supply and demand and therefore maximize total surplus in the short run, but in the long run, it also drives firms to produce at their efficient scale meaning they minimize the average total cost of production to society as a whole. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching, and I hope you're all staying safe, staying healthy, and practicing responsible social distancing.